Professor Renee Hopes is an internationally recognized authority on digital and media literacy education. She's a founder and the director of the Media Education Lab. She will be talking about teaching the conspiracies. The term fake news has attracted a lot of interest from policymakers, educational leaders, and the public because conspiracy theories and disinformation are on the rise. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so my question, can learning about conspiracy theories advance the media literacy competencies of adolescents? I'm going to tell you a story about a great experience that I had this March when I got to go to a German high school and work with high school students for half a day. Our topic was conspiracy theories. I wanted to see what kinds of activities and what kinds of dialogue could we have about conspiracy theories and how might that conversation promote critical thinking about media. So conspiracy theories are fun to talk about with teenagers because every teenager knows a lot about these conspiracy theories. And I bet if you remember when you were young, you were kind of attracted to them too. Maybe you remember the Ma Marilyn Monroe conspiracy theories, right? Did she sleep with John F. Kennedy? Who knows? Of course, the Hillary Clinton conspiracy theories, the killer clown conspiracy theories, and the Illuminati conspiracy theories. In fact, I invite you to um, see how many conspiracy theories on this list you can recognize. Are you familiar with the chemtrails conspiracy theory? Give me a thumbs up if you are. Okay, how about the Mary Magdalene? Yeah, mm -hmm. maybe she had sex with Jesus and produced a baby. How about the CIA experiments? Are you familiar with those? Look at all the hands up, wow. The Elvis conspiracy? Yeah, he, I saw him down there in Sarajevo in the bad side of town. Uh, the vaccines, autism, conspiracy. Look at the hands up. Oh my gosh. The fluoride, the fluoride conspiracy. How about the Illuminati? Yeah, you know that one. The reptilian elite, right? Yeah. <laughs> Ebola. Ebola caused by the CIA, de deliberately spread Ebola. You, you, you knew that? Did you know that? And global warming. Some people think that's a conspiracy, too. Okay, so as part of my Mind Over Media initiative, analyzing contemporary propaganda, I've been trying to figure out what's the pedagogy, what's the instructional practices that allow us to bring controversial topics, difficult topics, topics that actually represent what we would say is bad information, disinformation, misinformation. How do we bring that into the classroom in order to critically analyze it? Pedagogically, this is an area fraught with challenge. That's why I wanted to explore it. Okay, so just to background, 7% of Americans think that the moon landings were faked. 15% uh, uh, of us believe that the media and government adds mind control technology to our broadcast TV signals. So many grown-ups, not just teenagers goofing around, many grown-ups believe in conspiracy theories. Um, so, but they're not all fun. And some conspiracy theories perhaps are truly dangerous and have real implications for the quality of public discourse all over the world. So, one conspiracy theory hit our country over the last three years. Donald Trump claimed that President Obama was not an American because he was not born in the United States. He was the architect of the birther conspiracy. And that conspiracy has left a long legacy. It turns out that even after it was debunked and President Obama produced a birth certificate showing he was born in Hawaii, 42% uh, of Republicans and 14% of Democrats believe that President Obama was not born in the United States. So conspiracy theories have had a huge impact on the quality of our political discourse. And it's possible that in your country, conspiracy theories also shape the quality of public discourse. And that's something for us to reflect upon. 
How do we create opportunities to have conversations about these very real kinds of misinformation and disinformation? So what is a conspiracy theory? Well, we like definitions, so here's a definition. It's a type of belief in which the ultimate cause of an event is believed to be due to a plot by multiple actors working together with a clear goal in mind, often unlawfully and in secret. Now, I'd like you to reflect a little bit on the people in your family. Think about your parents, your grandparents, perhaps your cousins or your uncles and aunts. Raise your hand if you have someone in your family who kind of is, got, believes in a conspiracy theory. Yeah. Most of us know people who believe in conspiracy theories. The data shows that if you believe in one conspiracy theory, you're more likely to believe in other conspiracy theories, right? Somehow, being open to a conspiracy theory kind of opens the door uh, to, to them. In order to understand conspiracy theories, we have to unpack really interesting words. So when I was working in the high school with the high school students in Germany, we had to define and understand words like disillusionment, anxiety, hoax, paranoia, ambiguity, open-mindedness, closure, and cynicism. So lots of rich opportunity to study clusters of psychological and political concepts uh, come in when you talk about conspiracy theories. Now, before I tell you what I did with the German high school students, allow me to tell you another, an interesting story. Because to prepare for my meeting with the German uh, high school students, I had to think a little bit about, well, what makes conspiracy theories so resilient, you know, so strong, so immutable, it seems. In 1968, the report from Iron Mountain was released to quite great acclaim in the United States. That was the time of the Vietnam War, you may remember. And this report by a distinguished uh, body of economists and political scientists and sociologists and defense specialists and um, military generals made a startling uh, conclusion with heavily footnoted scientific data, tables and charts, a serious white paper style report. It concluded, peace is not in the best interest of a stable society. It concluded, even if lasting peace could be achieved, it would almost certainly not be in the best interest of society to achieve it. Whoa! What a mind-boggling report! Well, it became a best-selling book. It was translated into 15 languages. And only four years after its publication, the author, along with his colleague, Kurt Lewin, uh, Leonard Lewin, and his colleague, Victor Navosky, admitted, it was a hoax. We made the story up. It was dark political satire. You may remember um, Stanley Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Love the Bomb. They wrote a dark political satire, a fake government report. Whoa, okay. It was, in fact, they said, a literary hoax. Time passes, time passes, 1972, 1982, 1990, 20 years later, the Liberty Lobby, a right-wing group, publishes the report as a public domain document. You know, if it's a government report, they can publish it freely, right? And they instantly get sued for copyright violation by Kurt Lewin, who said, wait a minute, you republished my document. I'm the author of that. I wrote the dark political satire. Don't publish it without my permission. The right-wing re websites sent this PDF all over. It's, all, it's reprinted all over the internet. They, the right-wing groups say, the hoax was a hoax, right? You see, the hoax was a hoax. So we get to this explanation of why conspiracy theories are resilient, because it's what we've been, we understand is the concept of infinite regress. 
right? Conspiracy theories are resilient because they can never be disproved. An infinite regress is a sequence of reasoning or a justification which can never come to an end. The hoax was a hoax, and the hoax of a hoax was a hoax, and it just keeps going on. It's very stable. A long time ago, a very clever writer said, when it comes to conspiracy theories, it's turtles all the way down. And by this, they were referring to Aristotle's famous idea. How does the world stay in, in place? Well, the ancients believed the world is perched on top of four elephants who are sitting on a turtle. But then the critical thinker says, well, what is the turtle sitting on? Well, the turtle's sitting on another turtle. And that turtle's sitting on another turtle. And that turtle's sitting on another turtle. It's turtles all the way down. So conspiracy theories are resilient. Interesting. Conspiracy theories also tap into what Daniel Kahneman called thinking fast and slow. We've been hearing a lot about that over the last two days. System one thinking, it's the fast, intuitive, automatic, creative thinking. Well, conspiracy theories to critically analyze them require the system two thinking, the logical, linear, analytical, and detail-oriented thinking. And one thing the researchers are helping us understand about conspiracy theories is that one exposure can be very powerful. One exposure to a conspiracy theory can have a big impact on people. In this study by Daniel Jolly and Karen Douglas, participants who were exposed to, oh, sorry, uh, participants who were exposed to a conspiracy uh, video were significantly less likely to think that there was widespread scientific agreement on human caused climate change. They were less likely to sign a petition to help reduce global warming. They were less likely to donate or volunteer for a charity in the next six months. So when I read this study, I thought, holy hell, I got to be careful what conspiracy theory I might put in front of my young, impressionable 15-year-olds. The power of a single exposure can have that kind of impact. How can I teach about conspiracy theories if I might risk perpetuating the conspiracy theory in my attempt to critically analyze it? However, scholars have also found that cr critical thinking activated toward conspiracy theories can reduce belief in them. So we have a little bit of the science, the science scientific evidence is not quite there yet, right? So now to my story. I do believe that media literacy educators can explore conspiracy theories to strengthen critical, the critical thinking skills, but I also acknowledge that screening conspiracy theory videos in the classroom risks validating them because there might not be enough time in class to examine the evidence in depth. There might be just too much junk information online for students to sort through it all. And it's too easy to trivialize conspiracy theories reinforcing us and them thinking. Of course, that's what I saw in this elite German high school where all the students spoke perfect English. English and they all said to me, oh, Anybody who believes in a conspiracy theory is a loser, an idiot, doesn't even deserve to be able to vote. These people are lowlifes, they are scum. And I thought, ooh, that's a, that's a problem. If we, if, we have, if we have family members who believe in conspiracy theories, then we don't want to trivialize conspiracy theories or reinforce this us-them thinking about them. We want to think in more complex ways about it. So. What did I bring into the German classroom? I brought in a four-minute video produced by Mark Dice about the autocomplete conspiracy. Have you heard about it? Ah. If you Google autocomplete conspiracy, you'll find quite a lot of these videos. Here's a screenshot from one. Mark Dice is a conspiracy theorist, and he says, Google has been, been manipulating the algorithms for the presidential election. When you type in Hillary Clinton, H, it doesn't pop up health problems. It says Hillary Clinton is awesome. Hillary Clinton is wonderful. Dice claims that Google has been suppressing the algorithm, manipulating it, so that mm, negative information about Hillary Clinton's health problems uh, do not show up in the autocomplete. And he does his best in a very slick four minute video to show you that he's right. What we did was we took that three or four minute video 
and we put it up into the video ant. For those of you who are not yet using this technology, I say go when you go home this weekend, go explore it immediately. It's the best tool ever invented for critically analyzing videos. When you register for Video Ant, which is produced by the University of Minnesota, it's an academic uh, tool, um, you can take any YouTube video, you pop it into the tool, and it immediately lets you watch the video. But then as you want, you can stop and pause and make a comment. So here are the students who, as they watched the video, stopped, paused, and thought. They watched, they stopped, they paused, they thought. After they did that, the quality of conversation we had was richer and deeper than it would have been if we had just watched the video, or if we hadn't watched the video. What a terrific tool. Video annotation is a powerful tool for critically analyzing conspiracy theories. We came to the conclusion in our conversation that the thing is Google search isn't neutral like any other set of complex algorithms, search is shot through with the values of its creators. So, should you discuss conspiracy theories in the classroom with your students? I don't know. I think that's a topic only you can reflect upon. And by thinking about the context and situation of your learners and your context, you'll make the right decision. I don't know if teaching the conspiracies is right for everyone, but I do think it's important for us to respond critically and sympathetically to their rise in culture today. As Yusinski and Parents wrote, conspiracy theories are alarm systems that help people deal with threat. They resonate among groups suffering from loss, weakness, or disunity. So, today I've just shared with you uh, five key ideas. Conspiracy theories are resilient. They cannot be easily disproved. They resonate in an age of anxiety by offering simple explanations for complex and ambiguous realities. And even although even brief exposures to conspiracy theories increases their believability, Analytical thinking can lower belief in conspiracy theories. Video annotation tools are a pedagogical godsend. They help slow down people's response to video and promote analytical and reflective thinking. And finally, teachers must wrestle with the important paradoxes when deciding whether, when, and how to teach about conspiracy theories. I'm going to tell you to teach the conspiracies. And you can read more about my adventures in the German high school if you go to the, this month's issue of Knowledge Quest. That's a publication of the American Association for School Librarians. Take a chance. Teach the conspiracies. Thanks very much. <laughs>